Chapter Two, Part Three of The Haunted Man and the Ghost's Bargain by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Gift Diffused, Part Three. Whither he went, he neither knew nor cared, so that he avoided company. The change he felt within him made the busy streets a desert, and himself a desert, and the multitude around him, in their manifold endurances and ways of life, a mighty waste of sand, which the winds tossed into unintelligible heaps and made a ruinous confusion of. Those traces in his breast, which the phantom had told him would die out soon, were not as yet so far upon their way to death, but that he understood enough of what he was and what he made of others to desire to be alone. This put it in his mind, he suddenly besought himself as he was going along, of the boy who had rushed into his room, and then he recollected that of those with whom he had communicated since the phantom's disappearance, that boy alone had shown no sign of being changed. Monstrous and odious as the wild thing was to him, he determined to seek it out and prove if this were really so and also to seek it with another intention which came into his thoughts at the same time. So, resolving with some difficulty where he was, he directed his steps back to the old college and to that part of it where the general porch was and where, alone, the pavement was worn by the tread of the students' feet. The keeper's house stood just within the iron gates, forming a part of the chief quadrangle. There was a little cloister outside, and from that sheltered place he knew he could look in at the window of their ordinary room and see who was within. The iron gates were shut, but his hand was familiar with the fastening, and drawing it back by thrusting in his wrist between the bars, he passed through softly, shut it again, and crept up to the window, crumbling the thin crust of snow with his feet. The fire to which he had directed the boy last night, shining brightly through the glass, made an illuminated place upon the ground. Instinctively avoiding this and going round it, he looked in at the window. At first he thought that there was no one there, and that the blaze was reddening only the old beams in the ceiling and the dark walls, but peering in more narrowly, he saw the object of his search coiled asleep before it on the floor. He passed quickly to the door, opened it, and went in. The creature lay in such a fiery heat that as the chemist stooped to rouse him it scorched his head. So soon as he was touched, the boy, not half awake, clutched his rags together with the instinct of flight upon him, half rolled and half ran into a distant corner of the room, where, heaped upon the ground, he struck his foot out to defend himself. "'Get up,' said the chemist. "'You have not forgotten me.' "'You let me alone,' returned the boy. "'This is the woman's house, not yours.' The chemist's steady eye controlled him somewhat, or inspired him with enough submission to be raised upon his feet and looked at. "'Who washed them and put those bandages where they were bruised and cracked?' asked the chemist, pointing to their altered state. "'The woman did.' "'And is it she who has made you cleaner in the face, too?' "'Yes, the woman.' Redlaw asked these questions to attract his eyes towards himself, and with the same intent now held him by the chin and threw his wild hair back, though he loathed to touch him. The boy watched his eyes keenly, as if he thought it needful to his own defence, not knowing what he might do next, and Redlaw could see well that no change came over him. "'Where are they?' he inquired. "'The woman's out.' "'I know she is.' Where is the old man with the white hair and his son? The woman's husband, do you mean? inquired the boy. Aye, where are those two? Out. Something's the matter somewhere. They were fetched out in a hurry and told me to stop here. Come with me, said the chemist, and I'll give you money. 
Come where? And how much will you give? I'll give you more shillings than you ever saw, and bring you back soon. Do you know your way to where you came from? You let me go, returned the boy, suddenly twisting out of his grasp. I'm not going to take you there. Let me be, or I'll leave some fire at you. He was down before it, and ready, with his savage little hand, to pluck the burning coals out. What the chemist had felt in observing the effect of his charmed influence stealing over those with whom he came in contact was not nearly equal to the cold, vague terror with which he saw this baby monster put it at defiance. It chilled his blood to look on the immovable, impenetrable thing in the likeness of a child, with its sharp, malignant face turned up to his, and its almost infant hand ready at the bars. "'Listen, boy,' he said, "'you shall take me where you please, so that you take me where the people are very miserable or very wicked. I want to do them good, and not to harm them.' You shall have money, as I have told you, and I will bring you back. Get up, come quickly. He made a hasty step towards the door, afraid of her returning. Will you let me walk by myself, and never hold me, nor yet touch me? said the boy, slowly withdrawing the hand with which he threatened, and beginning to get up. I will. And let me go before, behind, or any ways I like. I will. Give me some money first, then, and I'll go. The chemist laid a few shillings one by one in his extended hand. To count them was beyond the boy's knowledge, but he said one every time, and avariciously looked at each as it was given, and at the donor. He had nowhere to put them out of his hand but in his mouth, and he put them there. Redlaw then wrote, with his pencil on a leaf of his pocket-book, that the boy was with him, and, laying it on the table, signed to him to follow. Keeping his rags together, as usual, the boy complied, and went out with his bare head and his naked feet into the winter night. Preferring not to depart by the iron gate by which he had entered, where they were in danger of meeting her whom he so anxiously avoided, the chemist led the way through some of those passages among which the boy had lost himself, and by that portion of the building where he lived, to a small door of which he had the key. When they got into the street he stopped to ask his guide, who instantly retreated from him, if he knew where they were. The savage thing looked here and there, and at length, nodding his head, pointed in the direction he designed to take. Redlaw going on at once, he followed, somewhat less suspiciously, shifting his money from his mouth into his hand and back again into his mouth, and stealthily rubbing it bright upon his shreds of clothes as he went along. Three times in their progress they were side by side. Three times they stopped being side by side. Three times the chemist glanced down at his face and shuddered as it forced upon him one reflection. The first occasion was when they were crossing an old churchyard, and Redlaw stopped among the graves, utterly at a loss how to connect them with any tender, softening, or consolatory thought. The second was when the breaking forth of the moon induced him to look up at the heavens, where he saw her in her glory, surrounded by a host of stars he still knew by the names and histories which human science has appended to them, but where he saw nothing else he had been wont to see, felt nothing he had been wont to feel in looking up there on a bright night. The third was when he stopped to listen to a plaintive strain of music, but could only hear a tune made manifest to him by the dry mechanism of the instruments and his own ears, with no address to any mystery within him, without a whisper in it of the past or of the future, powerless upon him as the sound of last year's running water or the rushing of last year's wind. At each of these three times, 
he saw with horror that in spite of the vast intellectual distance between them and their being unlike each other in all physical respects, the expression on the boy's face was the expression on his own. They journeyed on for some time, now through such crowded places that he often looked over his shoulder thinking he had lost his guide, but generally finding him within his shadow on his other side. Now by ways so quiet that he could have counted his short, quick, naked footsteps coming on behind, until they arrived at a ruinous collection of houses, and the boy touched him and stopped. In there, he said, pointing out one house where there were scattered lights in the windows and a dim lantern in the doorway with lodgings for travellers painted on it. Redlaw looked about him from the houses to the waste piece of ground on which the houses stood, or rather did not altogether tumble down, unfenced, undrained, unlighted, and bordered by a sluggish ditch. From that to the sloping line of arches, part of some neighbouring viaduct or bridge with which it was surrounded, and which lessened gradually towards them until the last but one was a mere kennel for a dog, the last a plundered little heap of bricks, from that to the child close to him, cowering and trembling with the cold, and limping on one little foot while he coiled the other round his leg to warm it, yet staring at all these things with that frightful likeness of expression so apparent in his face that Redlaw started from him. In there! said the boy, pointing out the house again. I'll wait. Will they let me in? asked Redlaw. Say you're a doctor, he answered with a nod. There's plenty ill there. Looking back on his way to the house door, Redlaw saw him trail himself upon the dust and crawl within the shelter of the smallest arch, as if he were a rat. He had no pity for the thing but he was afraid of it, and when it looked out of its den at him, he hurried to the house as a retreat. "'Sorrow, wrong, and trouble,' said the chemist, with a painful effort at some more distinct remembrance, "'at least haunt this place darkly. He can do no harm who brings forgetfulness of such things here.' With these words he pushed the yielding door and went in. There was a woman sitting on the stairs, either asleep or forlorn, whose head was bent down on her hands and knees. As it was not easy to pass without treading on her, and as she was perfectly regardless of his near approach, he stopped and touched her on the shoulder. Looking up, she showed him quite a young face, but one whose bloom and promise were all swept away, as if the haggard winter should unnaturally kill the spring. With little or no show of concern on his account, she moved nearer to the wall to leave him a wider passage. "'What are you?' said Redlaw, pausing, with his hand upon the broken stair-rail. "'What do you think I am?' she answered showing him her face again. He looked upon the ruined temple of God, so lately made, so soon disfigured, and something which was not compassion for the springs in which a true compassion for such miseries as its rise were dried up in his breast, but which was nearer to it for the moment than any feeling that had lately struggled into the darkening but not yet wholly darkened night of his mind, mingled a touch of softness with his next words. "'I am come here to give relief, if I can,' he said. "'Are you thinking of any wrong?' She frowned at him, and then laughed and then her laugh prolonged itself into a shivering sigh as she dropped her head again and hid her fingers in her hair. "'Are you thinking of a wrong?' 
he asked once more. I am thinking of my life, she said with a momentary look at him. He had a perception that she was one of many, and that he saw the type of thousands when he saw her drooping at his feet. What are your parents? he demanded. I had a good home once. My father was a gardener far away in the country. Is he dead? He's dead to me. All such things are dead to me. You a gentleman and not know that. She raised her eyes again and laughed at him. Girl, said Redlaw sternly, before this death of all such things was brought about, was there no wrong done to you? In spite of all that you can do, does no remembrance of wrong cleave to you? Are there not times upon times when it is misery to you? So little of what was womanly was left in her appearance that now, when she burst into tears, he stood amazed. But he was more amazed and much disquieted to note that in her awakened recollection of this wrong, the first trace of her old humanity and frozen tenderness appeared to show itself. He drew a little off, and in doing so observed that her arms were black, her face cut, and her bosom bruised. "'What brutal hand has hurt you so?' he asked. "'My own. I did it myself,' she answered quickly. "'It is impossible.' "'I'll swear I did. He didn't touch me. I did it to myself in a passion and threw myself down here. He wasn't near me. He never laid a hand upon me.' In the white determination of her face, confronting him with this untruth, he saw enough of the last perversion and distortion of good surviving in that miserable breast to be stricken with remorse that he had ever come near her. "'Sorrow, wrong, and trouble,' he muttered, turning his fearful gaze away. "'All that connects her with the state from which she has fallen has those roots.' In the name of God, let me go by. Afraid to look at her again, afraid to touch her, afraid to think of having sundered the last thread by which she held upon the mercy of heaven, he gathered his cloak about him and glided swiftly up the stairs. Opposite to him on the landing was a door which stood partly open, and which, as he ascended, a man with a candle in his hand came forward from within to shut. But this man, on seeing him, drew back with much emotion in his manner, and, as if by a sudden impulse, mentioned his name aloud. In the surprise of such a recognition there, he stopped, endeavouring to recollect the wan and startled face. He had no time to consider it, for, to his yet greater amazement, old Philip came out of the room and took him by the hand. "'Mr. Redlaw,' said the old man, "'this is like you. This is like you, sir. You have heard of it and have come after us to render any help you can. Ah, oh, too late, too late.' Redlaw, with a bewildered look, submitted to be led into the room. A man lay there on a truckle-bed, and William Swidger stood at the bedside. "'Too late,' murmured the old man, looking wistfully into the chemist's face, and the tears stole down his cheeks. "'That's what I say, father,' interposed his son in a low voice. "'That's where it is, exactly. To keep as quiet as ever we can while he's a-dozing is the only thing to do. You're right, father.' Redlaw paused at the bedside and looked down on the figure that was stretched upon the mattress. It was that of a man who should have been in the vigour of his life, but on whom it was not likely the sun would ever shine again. The vices of his forty or fifty years' career had so branded him that in comparison with their effects upon his face, the heavy hand of time upon the old man's face who watched him had been merciful and beautifying. "'Who is this?' asked the chemist, looking round. 
my son george mr redlaw said the old man wringing his hands my eldest son george who was more his mother's pride than all the rest redlaw's eyes wandered from the old man's grey head as he laid it down upon the bed to the person who had recognised him and who had kept aloof in the remotest corner of the room he seemed to be about his own age and although he knew no such hopeless decay and broken man as he appeared to be there was something in the turn of his figure as he stood with his back towards him and now went out at the door that made him pass his hand uneasily across his brow william he said in a gloomy whisper who is that man why you see sir returned mr william that's what i say myself why should a man ever go and gamble and the like of that and let himself down inch by inch till he can't let himself down any lower has he done so asked redlaw glancing after him with the same uneasy action as before just exactly that sir returned william swidger as i'm told he knows a little about medicine sir it seems and having been wayfaring towards london with my unhappy brother that you see here mr william passed his coat sleeve across his eyes and being lodging upstairs for the night what i say you see is that strange companions come together here sometimes he looked in to attend upon him and came for us at his request what a mournful spectacle sir but that's where it is it's enough to kill my father redlaw looked up at these words and recalling where he was and with whom and the spell he carried with him which his surprise had obscured retired a little hurriedly debating with himself whether to shun the house that moment or remain yielding to a certain sullen doggedness which it seemed to be a part of his condition to struggle with he argued for remaining was it only yesterday he said when i observed the memory of this old man to be a tissue of sorrow and trouble and shall i be afraid to-night to shake it are such remembrances as i can drive away so precious to this dying man that i need fear for him no i'll stay here but he stayed in fear and trembling none the less for these words and shrouded in his black cloak with his face turned from them stood away from the bedside listening to what they said as if he felt himself a demon in the place father murmured the sick man rallying a little from his stupor my boy my son george said old philip you spoke just now of my being mother's favourite long ago it's a dreadful thing to think now of long ago no 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 returned the old man think of it don't say it's dreadful it's not dreadful to me my son it cuts you to the heart father for the old man's tears were falling on him yes yes said philip so it does but it does me good it's a heavy sorrow to think of that time but it does me good george oh think of it too think of it too and your heart will be softened more and more where's my son william william my boy your mother loved him dearly to the last and with her latest breath said tell him i forgave him blessed him and prayed for him those were her words to me i have never forgotten them and i'm eighty-seven father said the man upon the bed i am dying i know i am so far gone that i can hardly speak even of what my mind most runs on is there any hope for me beyond this bed there is hope returned the old man 
for all who are softened and penitent there is hope for all such oh he exclaimed clasping his hands and looking up i was thankful only yesterday that i could remember this unhappy son when he was an innocent child but what a comfort it is now to think that even god himself has that remembrance of him redlaw spread his hands upon his face and shrunk like a murderer ah oh, feebly moaned the man upon the bed the waste since then the waste of life since then but he was a child once said the old man he played with children before he lay down on his bed at night and fell into his guiltless rest he said his prayers at his poor mother's knee i have seen him do it many a time and seen her lay his head upon her breast and kiss him sorrowful as it was to her and to me to think of this when he went so wrong and when our hopes and plans for him were all broken this gave him still a hold upon us that nothing else could have given oh father so much better than the fathers upon earth oh father so much more afflicted by the errors of thy children take this wanderer back not as he is but as he was then let him cry to thee as he has so often seemed to cry to us as the old man lifted up his trembling hands the son for whom he made the supplication laid his sinking head against him for support and comfort as if he were indeed the child of whom he spoke when did man ever tremble as redlaw trembled in the silence that ensued he knew it must come upon them knew that it was coming fast my time is very short my breath is shorter said the sick man supporting himself on one arm and with the other groping in the air and i remember there is something on my mind concerning the man who was here just now father and william wait is there really anything in black out there yes yes it is real said his aged father is it a man what i say myself george interposed his brother bending kindly over him it's mr redlaw i thought i had dreamed of him ask him to come here the chemist whiter than the dying man appeared before him obedient to the motion of his hand he sat upon the bed it has been so ripped up to-night sir said the sick man laying his hand upon his heart with a look in which the mute imploring agony of his condition was concentrated by the sight of my poor old father and the thought of all the trouble i have been the cause of and all the wrong and sorrow lying at my door that was it the extremity to which he had come or was it the dawning of another change that made him stop that what i can do right with my mind running on so much so fast i'll try to do there was another man here did you see him redlaw could not reply by any word for when he saw that fatal sign he knew so well now of the wandering hand upon the forehead his voice died at his lips but he made some indication of assent he is penniless hungry and destitute he is completely beaten down and has no resource at all look after him lose no time i know he has it in his mind to kill himself it was working it was on his face his face was changing hardening deepening in all its shades and losing all its sorrow 
don't you remember don't you know him he pursued he shut his face out for a moment with the hand that again wandered over his forehead and then it lowered on redlaw reckless ruffianly and callous why damn you he said scowling round what have you been doing to me here i have lived bold and i mean to die bold to the devil with you and so lay down upon his bed and put his arms up over his head and ears as resolute from that time to keep out all access and to die in his indifference if redlaw had been struck by lightning it could not have struck him from the bedside with a more tremendous shock but the old man who had left the bed while his son was speaking to him now returning avoided it quickly likewise and with abhorrence where's my boy william said the old man hurriedly william come away from here we'll go home home father returned william are you going to leave your own son where's my own son replied the old man where why there that's no son of mine said philip trembling with resentment no such wretch as that has any claim on me my children are pleasant to look at and they wait upon me and get my meat and drink ready and are useful to me i've a right to it i'm eighty-seven you're old enough to be no older muttered william looking at him grudgingly with his hands in his pockets i don't know what good you are myself we could have a deal more pleasure without you my son mr redlaw said the old man my son too the boy talking to me of my son why what has he ever done to give me any pleasure i should like to know i don't know what you have ever done to give me any pleasure said william sulkily let me think said the old man for how many christmas times running have i sat in my warm place and never had to come out in the cold night air and have made good cheer without being disturbed by any such uncomfortable wretched sight as him there is it twenty william nigh a forty it seems he muttered why when i look at my father sir and come to think of it addressing redlaw with an impatience and irritation that were quite new i'm whipped if i can see anything in him but a calendar of ever so many years of eating and drinking and making himself comfortable over and over again i'm eighty-seven said the old man rambling on childishly and weakly and i don't know as i ever was much put out by anything i'm not going to begin now because of what he calls my son he's not my son i've had a power of pleasant times i recollect once no i don't no it's broken off it was something about a game of cricket and a friend of mine but it's somehow broken off i wonder who he was i suppose i liked him and i wonder what became of him i suppose he died but i don't know and i don't care neither <laughs> i don't care a bit in his drowsy chuckling and the shaking of his head he put his hands into his waistcoat pockets in one of them he found a bit of holly left there probably last night which he now took out and looked at berries eh said the old man ah oh, it's a pity they're not good to eat i recollect when i was a little chap about as high as that and out a-walking with let me see who was i out a-walking with no i don't remember how that was i don't remember as i ever walked with any one particular or cared for any one or any one for me berries eh there's good cheer when there's berries 
well i ought to have my share of it and to be waited on and kept warm and comfortable for i'm eighty-seven and a poor old man i'm eighty-seven eighty-seven the drivelling pitiable manner in which as he repeated this he nibbled at the leaves and spat the morsels out the cold uninterested eye with which his youngest son so changed regarded him the determined apathy with which his eldest son lay hardened in his sin impressed themselves no more on redlaw's observation for he broke his way from the spot to which his feet seemed to have been fixed and ran out of the house his guide came crawling forth from his place of refuge and was ready for him before he reached the arches. "'Back to the woman's,' he inquired. "'Back quickly,' answered Redlaw. "'Stop nowhere on the way.' For a short distance the boy went on before, but their return was more like a flight than a walk, and it was as much as his bare feet could do to keep pace with the chemist's rapid strides shrinking from all who passed shrouded in his cloak and keeping it drawn closely about him as though there were mortal contagion in any fluttering touch of his garments he made no pause until they reached the door by which they had come out he unlocked it with his key went in accompanied by the boy and hastened through the dark passages to his own chamber the boy watched him as he made the door fast and withdrew behind the table when he looked round. "'Come,' he said. "'Don't you touch me. You've not brought me here to take my money away.' Redlaw threw some more upon the ground. He flung his body on it immediately as if to hide it from him, lest the sight of it should tempt him to reclaim it, and not until he saw him seated by his lamp, with his face hidden in his hands, began furtively to pick it up. When he had done so, he crept near the fire, and, sitting down in a great chair before it, took from his breast some broken scraps of food, and fell to munching and to staring at the blaze, and now and then to glancing at his shillings, which he kept clenched up in a bunch in one hand. "'And this,' said Redlaw, gazing on him with increased repugnance and fear, is the only one companion I have left on earth. How long it was before he was aroused from his contemplation of this creature whom he dreaded so, whether half an hour or half the night, he knew not. But the stillness of the room was broken by the boy whom he had seen listening, starting up and running towards the door. He is the woman coming, he exclaimed. The chemist stopped him on his way at the moment when she knocked. "'Let me go to her, will you?' said the boy. "'Not now,' returned the chemist. "'Stay here. Nobody must pass in or out of the room now. "'Who's that?' "'It's I, sir,' cried Milly. "'Pray, sir, let me in.' "'No, not for the world,' he said. "'Mr. Redlaw, Mr. Redlaw, pray, sir, let me in.' "'What is the matter?' he said, holding the boy. The miserable man you saw is worse, and nothing I can say will wake him from his terrible infatuation. William's father has turned childish in a moment. William himself is changed. The shock has been too sudden for him. I cannot understand him. He is not like himself. Oh, Mr. Redlaw, pray advise me, help me. No, no no he answered mr redlaw dear sir george has been muttering in his doze about the man you saw there who he fears will kill himself better he should do it than come near me he says in his wanderings that you know him that he was your friend once long ago that he is the ruined father of a student here my mind misgives me of the young gentleman who has been ill what is to be done how is he to be followed how is he to be saved mr redlaw pray oh pray advise me help me 
All this time he held the boy, who was half mad to pass him and let her in. Phantoms, punishers of impious thoughts, cried Redlaw, gazing round in anguish. Look upon me. From the darkness of my mind, let the glimmering of contrition that I know is there shine up and show my misery. In the material world, as I have long taught, nothing can be spared. No step or atom in the wondrous structure could be lost without a blank being made in the great universe. I know now that it is the same with good and evil, happiness and sorrow in the memories of men. Pity me, relieve me. There was no response but her, Help me, help me, let me in, and the boys struggling to get to her. Shadow of myself, spirit of my darker hours, cried Redlaw in distraction. Come back and haunt me day and night, but take this gift away. Or, if it must still rest with me, deprive me of the dreadful power of giving it to others, undo what I have done, leave me benighted, but restore the day to those whom I have cursed. As I have spared this woman from the first, and as I never will go forth again, but will die here with no hand to tend me save this creature's who is proof against me, hear me. The only reply still was the boy struggling to get to her while he held him back, and the cry increasing in its energy, Help me! Let me in! He was your friend once! How shall he be followed? How shall he be saved? They are all changed! There is no one else to help me! Pray, pray, let me in! End of chapter 2